John chapter number 8. I'm going to read a few verses, beginning in verse number 1. A very familiar story. It says, Jesus went unto the Mount of Olives, and early in the morning he came again into the temple, and all the people came unto him, and he sat down and taught them. And the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery, and when they had set her in the midst, they said unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned, but what sayest thou? This they said, tempting him, that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down, and with his finger wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. So when they continued asking him, he lift, lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him cast a stone at her. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even to the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Now, in this passage, again, like I said, very familiar passage of Scripture. It's been preached on time and time again. Okay, why? Because, well, one, it's part of the Bible. But two, there's a lot of good things happening in the story. But, in this account of one of Jesus' days, by way of introduction, just some things I want you to notice. First off, where's he at? Well, he says he went into the Mount of Olives in verse number 1. Verse number 2, early in the morning, he came again into the temple. So he had been in this temple before, but on this particular day, it's early in the day, he once again goes into the temple. Well, that means that we know it's Saturday if he's going there to worship. But could have been any other day of the week, too. The Jews did frequent the temple whenever they had need to make sacrifice, which Jesus wasn't going there to do because he was sinless. But also to teach or to hear the word of God read because that's why, you know, people would go to the temple on other days besides Saturday because they would read the law what Moses had written down what the prophets had said because not everybody had a copy in their lap or at their house some may not even have a complete copy of everything that had been written in their city they may have had to rely on somebody copying it and then sending it to them so that they could I don't know have the book of Isaiah or perhaps their copy of Exodus had become so torn or so used that it was falling apart on them. They were waiting for another copy from the scribes. Hey, but Jesus just went in one day. It's early in the morning. But he had been there before. It says he went in again into the temple. Okay, And all the people came unto him. So he's still in the temple. Okay, And he sat down and taught them. Then the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him Jesus didn't leave. They brought this woman caught in the act of adultery unto him. And they said to him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. And then from verse number 5 and verse number 6, nowhere in there do you see that they left the temple. They brought her in, accused her, said, hey, this is what Moses said we ought to do. She should be stoned. And then it says, you know, they said this, trying to tempt him so that they might have you know, an accusation to bring against him that he said different than the law. Okay? But then Jesus stooped down in verse number 6 and with his finger wrote on the ground as, he, as though he heard them not. Okay? Then verse number 8 or verse number 7 when they continued asking him he lifted himself up. And he said, hey, Y'all a bunch of sinners too. He's asking, a, he gave a statement, you know, if you're without sin, let him throw the first stone. Cast the first stone, as we often say. Okay, then he stooped back down at the end of the verse, in verse number 8, and wrote on the ground. Then in verse number 9, and they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one. 
Still in the temple. They went out. Okay? So as I'm reading this, I've read this before, heard this before. But Brian, how many times have you heard the analogy that Jesus wrote down in, wrote in the dirt with his finger? Well, I, I, don't, I don't find that he's outside. He's in the temple. And how many times throughout the New Testament do we find that Jesus, given the analogy, was the stone that was rejected of the builders, but made chief of the corner by God? Because the temple had a foundation. That means it wasn't an earthen floor with walls and a roof. It had a stone floor. So if Jesus is in the temple and stooped down and wrote on the ground, that means, as far as I can tell, now granted, this might be theology according to Brother Jordan, but God pointed this out to me. One of two things had to happen. He reached through the stone floor and then wrote on the ground. Hey, that'd be pretty amazing. Or with his finger, he carved into the stone floor of the temple. On either occasion, how are you going to sit there still bugging him when he's sitting there just carving into the floor with his finger? Because it said in verse number 7, so when they continued asking him, they weren't paying attention to what he was doing. They kept bringing up the question, well, what do you say, Jesus? What's your answer, Jesus? We know what Moses said. What do you say? Should we stone her? Shouldn't we stone her? Where do you sit on this issue? Got up, gave him an answer, and then went right back to it. Now, Jesus is in the temple. So if he was riding into the stone floor with his... Now, granted, there's also the possibility that people had tracked in dirt, and he was writing in the dirt that they tracked in. But either way, he's in the temple. Now, the temple, consecrated unto God, meant to be kept holy. That's what the priests were there to do. They were there to continually offer up sacrifice and praise unto God. They were there continually to cleanse the instruments of the temple so that they were in proper use and in proper order. Or could be used properly and in proper order. So why would Jesus, as I've heard some people teach, that he stooped down and started writing those men's sin onto the floor? That would defile the house of God. He's in the temple. He would not do anything to tarnish his father's house. So what's he writing down? Well, I believe he could just be writing down some of the other commandments from the Old Testament. I believe that maybe he's writing things down that in other portions of Scripture, you know, love thy, the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. Maybe he's just writing that down. But all that he said to him was, in verse number 6, or in verse number 7, sorry, he that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. That's all he said. We don't know what he wrote. But we know that even though he was writing, they weren't paying attention. Because in verse number 9, and they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience. They didn't read it. They heard it. So they weren't paying attention to what he was writing. Okay? But in verse number 9, they which heard it, they heard him say, ye that are without sin. Then, after they conv get convicted, they went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. Well, if she was outside... She couldn't be in the middle of something if everybody else was gone. Okay, so again, another point for them being in the temple. So Jesus was in the temple. This lady's left. And to paraphrase, he says, Woman, where are thine accusers? She said, I have none. He says, I don't accuse you either. So go and sin no more. Now he acknowledges that she did sin. He didn't say that these men wrongfully accused you. He said, go don't do it anymore. Neither do I accuse you. You can't be guilty of something if there's not somebody there to prosecute you. And Jesus wasn't asked to be the 
prosecutor, they came unto her, or unto him, brought her with them, and said, hey, what do you judge that we should do to her? So Jesus wasn't there to judge, or I mean to prosecute, he was there to judge, but he also knew that if they brought these accusations against her, and if somebody was still there accusing her, that he would ask the judge that she was guilty of what she had done. He didn't say that you didn't sin. He just said there's nobody here to accuse you of sin. There's nobody here to point out that you were wrong and since over the year, you know, you can't prove a negative is what he's trying to say. If there's nobody to claim it, we can't try it. So go. But don't do it again. He acknowledges that what she had done was wrong, but he says, I can't judge you because there's nobody here to bring a railing accusation against you. There's no two or three witnesses to say that, you know, they saw you committing the act or that they caught you in the act. So in other words, he said, there's nothing I can do. I don't accuse you because I was asked to judge. So that's the stage that was set there. Now, very special thing about this portion of the scripture, it's the only time that you're going to find any version of the word convict throughout your Bible. Now we know the doctrine of conviction. Right? We talked about that before in the Sunday school class. Well, in verse number 9, and they which heard it being convicted by their own conscience. Okay, it was an inward thing. We know they're going to... Now there are many other places throughout the Bible that we could take you. The word conviction isn't used, but we can show you that that's what was taking place. I mean, we go over to look and look at those two men on the road to Emmaus. What did they say? Didn't our hearts burn within us? Well, that's the same thing that's happening here. They were convicted by their own conscience. So what does this word convicted mean? They were looking for this woman to be convicted, but they were the ones that got convicted in the end. But what does that word mean? Well, we think convict, we think, well, it means that they're guilty of something. Well... Yes and no. That's how we use it now. It means to be convinced of something. The word convict means to convince someone. So when they say that a jury convicted someone, it means that they were convinced that, they, that that person had done it, that they were guilty or that they did what the other person said that they did. That based on the evidence, they thought, yeah, that person did it. Without a doubt. Well, what's it talking about in this sense? It says here that they were convicted by their own conscience. Well, now we need to biblically just define what a conscience is. Right? That is, if you study it out, everything's going to point you back to the soul. The thing that knows the difference between right and wrong. Because Adam and Eve, when they sinned in the garden, and they took of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they understood the difference between good and evil. And that was passed down through all of their children. Right? They knew good and evil. Before that, they'd only known good. Now they knew good and evil. And they knew that they had sinned before God. That's why they hid themselves. Well, if they were convicted in their own conscience, it means that their soul was convinced that they were wrong. That's why they all left. Notice it didn't just say that all of her accusers left. No, everybody left. It was just her and Jesus when everybody walked out. So what's that mean? Well, some people came in accusing and then everybody else jumped on the bandwagon. Everybody else that was there to hear Jesus teach that day, they saw this woman and said, yep, she deserves to be stoned. And then after Jesus said, ye that are without sin... All of them got convicted because all of them knew none of them were worthy to cast the first stone at this lady. And all of them got convicted and walked out so that by the time everybody left, it was just Jesus and this woman. They didn't leave because Jesus had stopped teaching. If they had stayed, I'm convinced he'd have kept on teaching. But none of them could stand to be there because they thought, wow, that, I really am more guilty than I thought I was. Perhaps that's, that, that's why I kind of leaned in. He might have written something down like, love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, all thy soul, and all that. Because you really start looking at that statement. The Spirit can convict you pretty quickly Amen. on all the things that you haven't lived up to that statement. Amen. But, 
We're not going to teach on most of that. We are going to be teaching on that phrase, convicted. Well, nowadays, the doctrine of conviction, who does the convicting? It is the Holy Spirit. Okay, well, you study your Bible. At this point in time, the Holy Spirit hadn't been sent in his role as the comforter. Hadn't been sent yet in his role to convict man. But why would you need the Holy Spirit when you're standing before the Son? And the Son is the one that's doing the talking to show you that you're wrong. Okay, this conviction is the same conviction that we feel nowadays. The only difference is Jesus was the one that spoke instead of the Spirit, speaking to our Spirit. And the convincing was done by the Son instead of the Spirit. But it's the same thing. Same thing. So anybody wants to say, well, they, didn't, they weren't convicted by the Spirit. See me after class, and then I'll smack you upside the back of the head. Same thing. Instead of God the Spirit talking, it was God the Son, and they were convinced in their soul. It didn't say that they were convinced in their mind or that they were convinced in their heart. They were convinced in their conscience. They were convicted in their soul, just like your soul got convicted when the Holy Spirit showed up and said, hey, you need to be born again. He convinced you that you were a sinner and that you needed a Savior. But see, conviction is not just about sin. That conviction, I've said it before, and we're going to elaborate on it a little bit more today, but when we get to heaven, we're going to thank God for conviction. A whole lot more than we thank Him for it down here now. Because really we don't understand that a lot of what we do comes from conviction. People think a conviction is a bad thing. Well, it hurts. Well, it hurt these people that day. It hurt them because they had something between them and God. And Jesus' words convinced their soul that they weren't as close to God as they thought they were. Because they thought they were close enough to God to cast stones for God. And God said, ye that are without sin. And they realized, we're not without sin. But see, it is that convincing that God does to us. That's what the conviction is. It's not God showing us that we're guilty. It's God showing us that either here's something new that you need to know or to establish something that we've heard but we hadn't applied or sometimes to show us where we aren't where he wants us to be. Okay, so with that in mind, we're going to teach on this morning, convinced by God. Convinced by God. Because nowadays it's the Spirit. But hey, he and his Father were one. The Father and the Son are one with the Spirit. They're all the same. So whether by the Spirit or by the Son, if you're convinced by God, something's going to happen. Notice they couldn't stay where they were. They, they had to make the decision. Granted, they're in the temple. What better place to be if you realize that you have sin than the place where you can, at this time, make a sacrifice before God and get it made right. But it doesn't say that they did that. It says from the eldest to the youngest, they walked out. Now why is it? Brother Bob, is one of these Brother Bob questions that I had. Why'd they go from the oldest to the youngest? Well, maybe. Some people, I'm sure the Bible correctors would say, well, it was just a custom that if someone was older than you and they wanted to walk out, that they would have gone. Well, if I was at the back of the crowd and I wanted to get out, I could have made it out before all the old people made it to where I was. Done said it. It says from the eldest to the youngest, that's the order that they left in. Why? Well, some people as they get older I may be slower on this than most people they do get a little bit wiser they get a little bit more common sense and maybe the elders realized quicker because they had a little bit more wisdom that I'm not perfect maybe throughout all the years they realized there's always going to be something between me and God as long as I'm in this flesh as long as I'm in this and they knew as soon as Jesus said it we're not without sin and I don't want to be a part of this because I feel that there's something wrong about this situation. But they were convicted of something and the eldest left first and the youngest took the longest to catch on. And how often do we see in Christianity those that first get in, they're zealous towards good works. They want to do something good. They just don't know where to go and they burn out real quick. But all these people thinking, oh, I'd be good to stone this lady. She's sinful. 
All the young ones saying, hey, that's wrong. She's guilty of it. And it took them the longest for that passion to wear off to realize, oh, wait, I'm guilty of stuff too. I don't know. But I do know the eldest walked out first. And then it took the youngest the longest to catch on. But eventually, everybody left. Everybody was convinced that they weren't worthy or they weren't close enough to God or they weren't spiritually arrived to where they could throw the stone on behalf of God. And they all left. Why? Because deep down in the gable end of their soul, God showed them, you're not worthy of it. Maybe in the, you know, recesses of their soul, God brought up something that they had put in their secret place. That song that Miss Melissa and Sister Gloria used to sing. They had something hidden away that they thought nobody knows about this, and God brought it before them and said, you deserve to be stoned for that. I don't know what it was, but the eldest caught on quickest. They were convinced easier. First thing about convinced of God, those that are listening will have the easiest time of being convinced. In order to be convinced of God, you've got to hear. Whether spiritually hear from the Word, you've got to be listening in order for God to convince you. And sometimes, anybody else been here? I'm, I'm talking about me, not talking about anybody else. Let's clear that up. Anybody else in here so hard-headed that you aren't listening the first time and then God has to eventually chasten you because you didn't hear the first time in order to unclog your ears so that you do hear him because he knows you need to be convinced of it. If we are so consumed with other things, maybe like those younger individuals that were all about, hey, we're going to have a stone in today. Took them a little bit longer, but eventually their ears got unclogged. But all of them ended up leaving. If God wants you convinced, it doesn't matter how consumed you are with other things, He'll get your attention eventually. But it is better to catch on sooner. And I don't know, maybe some of those elder folks went out and they did make sacrifice for the things that weren't right between them and God. But then they still understood, I'm not worthy to judge that person. They didn't come back. There was a permanent change made because none of them went out and then came back in and said, hey, I got it made right. I'm ready to stone that lady. They all left and none of them came back. Because if God convinces you of something, it's going to stick. It's not me convincing you. If I convince you of something, somebody else that has you know, letters at the end of their name on a business card or somebody that you know, may claim that they've been around the block once or twice more, if I convince you of it, somebody else may come along and convince you that they're better qualified and they may convince you of something else. Why do you think everything that we do around here is based off of this? Because if God convinces you of it from his word, no man will be able to unconvince you of it. When you realized you were a sinner, nobody else could have told you otherwise. Because if God convinced you of it, it's going to stick. Some people already know that they're a sinner, but they haven't been convinced that Jesus is their Savior. But once they do hear it, it may take them a while. They may be like Brother Kevin, coming in and having splitting headaches. And they may wrestle with it for a little bit. But once they realize it, they're going to know. And they may be able to stay away long enough that that conviction or that conv convincing wears off. But if they come back, it's still going to be just as strong. It's those people that are convinced. If somebody was in the temple that day and walked out and never came back to the temple, they never did business with God again. It wasn't the conviction's fault that they left. They didn't want to admit that they were wrong and face that they were wrong so they never came back to the place where the conviction happened. But these people, they didn't come back. Something changed in them. Because they left their mission to stone this woman and to try and catch Jesus in a predicament. Because granted also, you can't stone somebody in the temple. What have defiled it? Right, so Jesus couldn't have said, yes, yeah, stone her right here. They, they, there were so many ways that they were trying to catch him under the law, under the customs of that day. 
Jesus knew it all. That's why he just stooped down and started writing on the ground. But they had all these plans laid out and none of them mattered by the time they walked out of that temple. They had forgotten because all of them had been convinced in their heart that there was something bigger that needed their attention. Okay, but the second thing when it comes to convincing, certain things that we need to be convinced of nowadays. Nowadays, everybody needs to be convinced that we're running out of time. That's what Brother Clint taught on last week. You study it out. End time prophecy and the things that God said would happen before Christ would come back for his, you know, for the rapture of the church and then the literal second coming. Where was Jesus at on this day? Verse number one, Mount of Olives. Where is he going to be on the day that he comes back and literally steps foot on the earth for the second time? He's going to land on that. Split it wide open. Here at this place, he knew one day there will be judgment on this mountain. But he said, today, I'm not here to judge. I'm here to show mercy. That's why he didn't answer. Because if he would have answered the question, she deserved to die. But he said... Instead of conviction or judgment today, I'll convince everybody that they need to get closer to God so that on the day that I land on this mountain and split it in half, they won't be one of the ones that are fighting against God. They'll be ones on white horses behind them, clothed in white linen, coming with them. He's saying, I will spare judgment today on the Mount of Olives because one day there's a time for judgment. But he convinced them that they need to get closer to God because they still had time. When he lands, out of time. When the rapture happens, they're out of time. Under the current dispensation. There will be a way for people to come to God throughout the tribulation period. But those that had already heard the gospel, out of time. Strong delusion will come upon them. But all the things that need to come under biblical study come to pass. For a while there, we were just waiting on Israel's 70th anniversary of being founded as a new state. That's already passed. The only thing keeping us here today and that the rapture hasn't happened is the grace of God. Amen. Some people need to be convinced that today is the day that the Lord has made. Yes. They need to sit down and have a talk with God and let God convince them tomorrow may never come. Yesterday can't be changed. All you can do is right now. I can tell someone right now. I can get something made right in my life so that the rest of the day I may be sensitive to listen to the Holy Spirit. To let Him lead, guide, and direct me. Some of us need to be convinced that today is the only day that we have. Because if God gives us tomorrow, that'll be the only day that we have. Today will be gone. And then the tomorrow for tomorrow may never come. It's now. Because if I don't do it now, I may never get the opportunity to do it. For a long time, people kept saying, well, you know, we have more time. We don't have that promise anymore. We can go to Psalms, you know, chapter number 90, where that's a Psalm of Moses, a prayer that he wrote down, and he wrote down that God extended a generation from 40 years to 70 years. He said three score and ten years. Well, three score and ten plus 48, okay, under our calendar, not even talking about the Jewish calendar, but if you do it by the Jewish calendar, yeah, we're way past the time that a generation has been resettled in the promised land. That means it literally could be today that we may not get tomorrow. He may roll back the eastern sky and we're going to hear a Amen. shout with the voice of an archangel. It's going to say, come up here and we're going to be gone. But some people aren't convinced of that. And those that are, if they've been convinced by a man, it's not going to stick. They need to be convinced of God that today is the day that I have. Some people need to be convinced. Not just... Uh, Jesus, he's coming back real soon. And when he comes back, seven years later, he's landing on that mountain. But some people need to be convinced to let go of the reins of their life. I'm supposed to walk in the Spirit 
But I'm supposed to do, not as I want, but Christ that liveth in me. Let him do what I ought to do. Some people haven't been convinced that the best life that they can have is the life that God dictates. The one where we do as he wills. Some people don't see the benefit in following after the biblical way to live a Christian life. They see the benefit in dabbling between the world and the things of God. According to the Bible, you're not dabbling, you're just living a worldly life. Amen. Some people are convinced of that. I'll show you how convinced the people in the early church were that the things of the world didn't matter. A lot of them sold everything that they had. Not everyone, because it says that they didn't meet in each other's house daily, breaking bread and teaching. Well, in order to do that, some of them still had to have houses. But those that sold all their stuff went to live with the ones that God said, no, you can't sell your house because we need that house. But they sold everything and gave it to the church. Why? Well, I mean, Jesus said that, you know, if you love father or mother, son or daughter, he told the rich, the rich ruler, you know, sell everything you have, take up your cross, follow me. Why, did, why does he teach that? Because he doesn't want anything to hinder us, as Sister Veronica sings that song. I don't want anything to hinder me. Keep me from being exactly where God wants me to be. Well, some of them realize this stuff, if I don't have to worry about this stuff, I can focus more on God. If I don't have to worry about the farm and keeping up the farm, if I'm not out there plowing every day, if I'm not out there, you know, watering oxen, if I'm not out there cleaning out some stables, I'm going to have a whole lot more time to do the things of God. Some of them, God didn't tell them to do that. I'm not saying everybody in here needs to give some up, but there's a whole lot in our life that if we allow God, He'd convince us we don't need that. Amen. Or we don't need as much of it. Amen. You know, we do need, we need to be convinced that there's a whole lot of prayer in prayer closets that needs to happen that isn't happening Psalms 91 verse 1 my verse he that dwelleth in the secret place of the most high shall abide under the shadow of the almighty you deal with God in a secret place it'll be known that you're walking in the shadow of God a lot of people don't see God's shadow falling on us nowadays because we don't spend time in the secret place there needs to be a whole lot more people convinced there's a whole lot of good that comes from dealing with God one-on-one -on -one when nobody else is looking. Jesus said, when you do your alms, do them not before men, because what God seeth in secret, he does reward openly. It'll be known that there's a shadow of God on your life. And people say, there's something different. Some people need to be convinced that the Holy Spirit is their best friend. He's not just some ethereal being. The Bible does say he's like the wind. He does blow like the wind. We can't tell where he's going to blow next, where he's going to be blowing from, how long he's going to be blowing. But when he's blowing, some people need to be convinced it's best to just sit down and fellowship with him. You do realize that the Holy Spirit, Jesus said he must go. It was better for him to leave so that the Spirit could come. Now, that doesn't mess with our minds because he's the Son of God. Surely it would have been great for the Son of God to stay on earth. But see, the Son of God can only be one place at one time. Under the constraints of being in the flesh as a man, he can only be in one place at one time. The Spirit of God can be everywhere at once. Has always been everywhere at once. Go to Genesis 1.1. The Spirit moved upon the face of the waters, plural. But he didn't manifest himself as the Comforter until Christ ascended into heaven after his crucifixion and resurrection but the reason that he manifested was so that we could now fellowship commune and have a relationship with God some people aren't convinced that it's worth having that relationship maybe they've been talked out of spiritual living because you know some people like Pentecostals and a whole bunch of other people that haven't messed up think that the Holy Spirit is supposed to do this and you're going to talk funny and you're going to roll around and you're going to handle snakes. That's not a God. Not just a snake thing, but any of that. Rolling around in the floor and, you know, dancing like the Shakers used to dance to get all the starch out of their clothes. I don't find that that's decent and in order, but hey, that's just Bible. 
The Holy Spirit isn't going to cause you to act like a maniac. Although you may get a little happy because Peter said, Hey, no, we're not drunk. We're just filled with the Holy Spirit. But some people need to be convinced of God. Not, I could preach until I'm blue in the face on how important it is to have a relationship with the Holy Spirit. I've got a book written by R.A. Torrey on the person and the work of the Holy Spirit. I can't finish it, Brother Mike, because every chapter is a new name in the Scriptures for the Holy Spirit, and I know that name, but I've never thought about what that meant, and I've never thought about how my relationship with the Holy Spirit could get stronger if I talked to Him as that entity, if I viewed Him in that way, and I get under conviction so much for not doing it, I've got to go apologize, saying, God, I'm sorry I didn't you know, see you that way before I can go back and finish the book. And it's an audio book, so most of the time i got to rewind and find out where it was that I stopped tuning in because I was under conviction so much. Well, what do you say? There's a whole lot more that we can learn about God if we'd listen. There's a whole lot more He could help us with if we'd allow Him. If we would allow Him to convince us that the best life that we can have is in the Spirit. But some people are convinced of it. Some people don't pick this up on any other day but Sunday and some maybe on Wednesday. Some people never give a thought about getting onto the church app and looking at the prayer requests that people put up because they don't spend time in their own prayer closet. Why would they care about the prayer requests that other people have? Some people have more faith in others to pray than they do themselves. That's why the only time that they give prayer requests are either through the prayer chain or here at church on Wednesday night. If you knew you could get a hold of heaven, why wait until Wednesday to give the prayer request? Why not pray on Monday and Tuesday or Sunday night when you get the news so that on Wednesday you can have a praise when you come into the house of God? Hey, God did this. Now, I'm not saying it's always going to work out like that. I mean, how long did we pray for our pastor when we found out that he had cancer? We prayed for a while, but it was all in God's timing. Sometimes there may be the time to request prayer, but if you've been already praying for it, there's going to be some conviction behind your prayer request because, hey, I know God wants to do something. I'm just praying that He does it in His time. I know that He's going to do it. I'm just praying that the church pray with me so that I don't get fleshly in it and ask that God do it now. I want God to do it when He'll get the honor and glory for it. That's a whole lot harder prayer request to pray. There's got to be a whole lot of conviction deep down inside that God's done in you to say, not my will, but thine. But see, again, it's not convinced by a man. You can be convinced by a man and it'll wear off. Most people aren't convinced by God in revival meetings. That's why the revival meeting stops when the preacher leaves. They listen to the preacher, and the preacher, they allow their mind to be convinced. They allow maybe part of their heart to be convinced. But they don't get convinced deep down in their soul by God because if they did they'd keep it with them when they left they would live it instead of just enjoying it while it happened we had a whole lot more points but we're not going to get to them i got about four minutes left so what's that is the great thing about conviction is why do you think that the three Hebrew boys said we are not careful to answer the old king they weren't careful because they had already had it convinced deep down within them that we'll serve God and nobody else. But a doubt in their mind. They didn't even need to think about it. We're not careful. We don't need time to we don't need to call a huddle. We don't need a, a timeout. We know exactly what the answer is going to be. And he says, You may call us Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, but we call ourselves Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael. And those are the names that God gave us. And we had them names long before we came into this foreign land, before you picked us out because we were the smartest of the bunch or because we knew a skill better than most of them. God gave us those gifts. And if God gave us those gifts so that we could stand in front of you just to let you know you're not a God and that statue that you made to look like you isn't worthy of bowing down to, so be it. Because we're convinced that God is God and you're not. We need more people to stand up with boldness. But you can't stand up with boldness like that if God hadn't convinced you of it down here. It's one thing to say you believe God. Well, if you were convinced of what you claim you believe, when that something were to come into your life, you wouldn't throw your hands up in the air, squalling, not knowing what to do. You would put into practice the thing that you said you believed because you were convinced by God that that's what you needed to do. 
That track that we have that, you know, people miss heaven by 18 inches. I'm convinced, Brother Bob, a whole lot of people miss spiritual living by 18 inches. Because they've got a head knowledge of how to live like a Christian, but they don't have the conviction in their soul to live it. I can't convict you or convince you. And it may be something as simple as God may convince you that you need to keep a stack of tracks in your car so that when you go through the drive-thru, you can hand a track to the lady or the man in the window of the drive-thru. But if God convinces you, you're always going to have tracks in there. If you try to do it in the flesh, you'll take a stack and you'll forget about them. And you may never. You'll move them from where they were because it's inconvenient. That's taking up a spot. You can put something else there. It's going to go into a glove box and then you'll forget about them. And then a year down the road, you clean out your car. A whole bunch of tracks. But if God convinced you to do it, you're going to need to restock often. In fact, you might even find that you're going to go through a drive through just to order a drink so that you can give a track to somebody. Because God told you to pull off the road and go get a drink over at that restaurant. Because if you're equipped, God will use you. Because you've been convinced that I just want to be an arrow in God's quiver. And wherever he wants to shoot me, that's where I'm going to go. Some of us are saying, I put my armor on because I believe God's going to send me into battle today. And I'm convinced that I need to put it on because the day that I don't may be the day that he wants to go tell me, hey, go talk to that person. And there may be a little bit of spiritual warfare between me and them and the armor is what's going to allow me to get there. But if I'm not convinced, put it on every day. If I'm not convinced that early will I seek thee, my mind's going to be on a whole bunch of other stuff besides God by the time I walk out the door in the morning. So the question is, are we willing every time we pray to say, Lord, first forgive me, but convince me of the things that I need to do, whether it's things you're not happy with or things we need to you know, add on to. I've got the first lesson down. Let's add the second lesson on top of it. I'm re I want you to convince me of something else. Or is it, Lord, convince me of who I need to share the gospel with today? But if we start praying for conviction and truly mean it, our lives will be transformed because God's going to do a whole lot of convincing down here. And when the rubber meets the road or when it gets a little hot, if it's settled deep down in here, you're not going to move. You're going to stand. Having done all to stand, you're just going to stand there for. You're going to resist the wiles of the devil. And as you resist him, he'll flee. And you'll make a difference. But those that are down here, they may claim that they know the rock. And they may be settled on the rock, but down here, they don't have the rock. It's a whole bunch of sifting sands. And when it's time to do something, they're not convinced of anything. That's why their life falls apart. That's why they're chasing so many strands, pieces of yarn, because they don't know which one's going to... So they're trying to grab all of them. That's our faith. Faith is, here's one strand, and if that's what God says to hold on to it, hold on to it. Because that thing's not going to give out. The world may say, there's no way that's going to work. But it will, if that's what God's giving. But see, here's the thing. If he convinces you of it, you get in here, you're going to find a whole bunch of little strains that when you put them together, it's a strong rope of faith that nothing in this world can break. If we're willing to put the time in to be convinced by God of what we need to be. And if we're just convinced to do what God wants us to do, the things that we haven't figured out on how we're going to do it or what we're going to say, he'll give them to us when we get there. But we have to by faith say, no, no, no. He told me this is what it is, and I'm convinced that that's what I need to do. Did you know that you could receive a daily devotion every morning in your inbox? Head on over to ibcflorence.com and click on Daily Devotions to sign up today. And as always, thanks for listening.